In this lecture, we're going to investigate some theorems that allow us to characterize linearly dependent and independent sets. So first, let's review that definition of linear independence and linear independence. So given a set of vectors, we're going to think about this vector equation x1, v1, plus x2, v2, plus, 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 and so on, through xp, vp, equaling the zero vector. So remember that we said that if that equation has a non-trivial solution, if it has any solution other than just setting all the x's equal to zero, then we say that that set is linearly dependent. But if there is no such solution, if there's no way to make the left-hand side equal the right-hand side here, except for setting the x's equal to zero, then we say that the set is linearly independent. So let's start out by thinking about how this definition applies to small sets of vectors. If we just have one vector in the set, then that vector equation isn't very interesting. It just has one term, one scalar times that one vector, equaling the zero vector. But again, if that equation has a non-trivial solution, has a solution anything other than just setting x1 equal to zero, then that set is linearly dependent. And if the equation has only the trivial solution, then that set is linearly independent. So if v is the zero vector, then it doesn't matter what that x scalar is, that scalar times the zero vector will be the zero vector. So that equation will have that non-trivial solution when the vector is the zero vector. But if the vector is not the zero vector, then it doesn't matter what scalar we multiply it by. If we don't multiply by zero, then we won't get the zero vector. So we summarize that here. So when we only have one vector, telling whether the set is linearly dependent or linearly independent is easy. If the vector is the zero vector, then that's linearly dependent. If it's not the zero vector, then it's linearly independent. Now things get a little bit more complicated when we're talking about a set of two vectors. Now our vector equation has two terms, x1, v1, plus x2, v2, equaling the zero vector. But again, what we're thinking about is whether or not that equation has any non-trivial solutions. So let's think about what would happen if we did have a non-trivial solution to that vector equation. That would mean that we would have two scalars, c1 and c2 here, not both zero. One of them could be zero, but not both zero. But what we could do then is subtract the c2, v2 from both sides. If we take this c2, v2 and subtract it from both sides, what we end up with is c1, v1 equals negative c2, v2. And then whichever coefficient, whichever scalar isn't zero, we divide both sides by that scalar. So we either get v1 equals negative c2 over c1, v2, or we get v2 equals negative c1 over c2, v1. But either way, what this shows us is that one of the vectors is a scalar multiple of the other. And that's going to be our characterization for a set of two vectors. So when we have a set of two vectors, it's linearly dependent if one of the vectors is a multiple of the other, but it's linearly independent if neither vector is a multiple of the other. Now, continuing in that way, we'd really like a way to characterize linearly dependent sets when we have a larger number of vectors in the set. And that leads us to this theorem. So the theorem says that when we have an indexed set S of vectors, and that word indexed here just means that the vectors are in some order. So they're ordered from one to P. And if we have two or more vectors in that set, then that set is linearly dependent if and only if at least one of the vectors in S is a linear combination of the others. So this if and only if statement is really two if-then statements. It says if the set S is linearly dependent, then one of the vectors in S is a linear combination of the others, and if one of the vectors in S is a linear combination of the others, then the set is linearly dependent. So when we prove this theorem, we'll have two if-then statements to prove. Now, the set, the, this theorem actually says slightly more, and this is go actually going to be the way that we prove the theorem. It says that if S is linearly dependent, and the first vector in the set isn't the zero vector, then one of the vectors in the set not only is a linear combination of the others, but it's actually a linear combination of the preceding vectors. And that'll actually be a useful fact for us to know a little later on in the course. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have two halves of this proof to work on. So when I write this little arrow here, what that means is that I'm proving the first statement implying the second statement. So in this case, I'm proving if S is linearly dependent, then one of the vectors in S is a linear combination 
of the others. And in specifically, I'm actually going to prove that stronger statement, which is that one of the vectors in S is a linear combination of the preceding vectors. Okay, so it's an if-then statement, so we're going to start by supposing that the hypothesis is true and try to show that the conclusion is true. So we're going to start by supposing that S is linearly dependent. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that there's a dependence relation. Remember, we've been talking about linear dependence, and so all it means for a set of vectors to be linearly dependent means that there is some solution to that vector equation where not all of the coefficients are zero. And so what we're going to do is zero in on the largest subscript for which the coefficient is not zero. Now, that might be the last coefficient. It might be that all of the coefficients are non-zero. That happens all the time. So whichever one is the last one in my list of coefficients, which isn't zero, I'm going to identify that one, and I'm going to call that subscript i. So that means that my solution here, my linear dependence relation, once I get past ci, all of the constants are zeros. So now I want to take the ci term, and I want to subtract that from both sides. Kind of like what we did when we had two vectors. So I have negative ci vi equals all the rest of the stuff that's left over. And notice that once I get past where all of the uh, constants are zeros, I can just throw those away because that's just one big zero vector. So what I really end up with is negative ci vi equals the sum of c1 v1 through c i minus 1 v i minus 1. But I know for sure that this coefficient is not zero. I identified that subscript specifically for it to not be zero. And so that means that I can divide both sides by negative ci. And what I get is the vector vi equaling a linear combination of the vectors that came before it. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove here. Now we're proving the reverse direction of the if and only if. Now we're proving that if one of the vectors in S is a linear combination of the others, then S is linearly dependent. So we're going to start with the hypothesis of that statement, which is to suppose that one of the vectors in S is a linear combination of the others. So again, we're just going to pick an arbitrary subscript i, and we've written this as a linear combination of everything except v sub i. Notice that we're skipping from i minus 1 to v i plus 1, because it's the other vectors. But now what we can do is subtract vi from both sides. So when we subtract vi from both sides, and we're just going to put it in this spot where it would go, that means it has a coefficient of negative 1, and since we subtracted it from both sides, we're left with a 0 vector. And this is a dependence relation because at least one of the coefficients, namely the negative 1, is not 0. And that shows that since we have a dependence relation among the vectors, that the set of vectors is linearly dependent. Okay, we have a couple more theorems here. These are easier to prove, and they talk about ways that we can quickly identify when a set is linearly dependent. And the first one says that if a set contains more vectors than there are entries in this vector, then the set is linearly dependent. So an example here would be maybe something like the set 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, 4, negative 1, negative 1, negative 3, and 4, 5, 6. So this set has four vectors, and there's three entries in each vector. So this would be an example of what this theorem is talking about, a set that contains more vectors than there are entries in each vector. And so what this theorem says is that any set like that would be linearly dependent. So this set that I just wrote down here, even though I just made those numbers up, that set of four vectors must be linearly dependent according to this theorem. So let's take a look and understand why. So what we're going to do is connect this vector equation back to matrix equations, which we haven't talked about for a while, but we talked about a while back. And what we do is we set up the coefficient matrix, which is the matrix whose columns are the, uh, the vectors that we're talking about. So the columns of A are the Vs, the V1, V2, all the way up through Vp. 
And that vector equation that we always talk about with linear dependence is equivalent to the matrix equation where ax equals zero. Now let's think about that matrix A. The matrix has n rows, one for each entry in the vector, and it has p columns, one for each vector. And if there's more vectors than entries in each vector, what that means is that the matrix A has more columns than rows. And that means that it's not possible for A to have a pivot in every column, because there's more columns than rows. We'll run out of columns even if we have a pivot in each row, which isn't even guaranteed. And so that means that if we're thinking about the matrix equation AX equals zero, since there's not a pivot in every column, that means that we have at least one free variable. One of the columns in that matrix corresponds to a free variable, and that means that we're going to have non-trivial solutions. So this really ties together a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about. Another quick way that we can identify a linearly dependent set is if that set contains the zero vector. Then that set would have to be linearly dependent. And here's the proof. What we want to do is renumber the vectors if we need to so that we put the zero vector first. That just makes it easier to write the, the next equation. So what we do is we put a coefficient of 1, and it really could be any non-zero number, but 1 works, in front of that v1. And since v1 is the zero vector, that's 1 times the zero vector. And then we have 0 times v2, which is the zero vector. 0 times v3, which is the zero vector. 0 times vp is the zero vector. And so all we have on the left-hand side is a bunch of zero vectors all added together, which indeed does give us the zero vector. And since not all of the coefficients were zero, the very first one was not zero, then this is a dependence relation for the vectors in S. So we're getting into the point where we're starting to prove theorems, we're starting to really understand the structures of these sets of vectors and working with ideas of linear independence. So this may be a video that you have to watch a few times to really dig into the proofs and understand how to do this. You will be asked to write your own simple proofs down the road, so try to follow the structure and the patterns here, and uh, we'll see you next time.